On today's edition of Cronkite Sports Live, we're taking it to the next level for our season finale. ASU football head coach Kenny Dillingham will join the show for an exclusive interview. Plus, we'll look to try to predict the future of Arizona State baseball when it comes to the postseason. Is the possibility of hosting a regional on the table? On top of that, more exclusive content for you. A behind-the-scenes tour of a wrestling facility that's attached to a home of an ASU wrestler. All of this and so much more on this edition of Cronkite Sports Live. Hello and welcome to the season 18 finale of Cronkite Sports Live. I'm Sammy Miller, that's Ethan Tuttle, and Ethan, needless to say, we are going out with a bang this semester. Yes, yeah, Sammy, that's right. We've got a whole boatload of awesome stuff for today's show, so let's get right into it. With the midweek showdown between two historic college baseball programs in Arizona State and Cal State Fullerton. Bottom two, nothing nothing on the scoreboard. Bronson Balholm sparks some life at the plate with an RBI double to bring Isaiah Jackson home and get ASU on the board first. You see Jackson crossing home plate right there. So now we're going to move to the top of the third. It's 2-1 and the Titans take their first lead of the series thanks to a Colby Wallace two-run blast. Later that inning, Zach Lou would keep it going with an RBI double to right field as the Titans just continue to swing the hot bat. And the Sun Devils once again finding themselves in that situation where they need to claw back. So it's a 4-1 lead for the Titans, but new Contradas had something to say about that in the bottom half of the frame. Him and Jacob Tobias' back-to-back one-run doubles to shorten the lead to one. And in the bottom of the fourth, Jacob Tobias doing pretty much what he's done all season long unloading on a pitch, bam, over the center field fence. That one went 420 feet is what I'm told. So a great job there with the Grand Slam and the Sun Devils take a 7-5 advantage. This game would go a little bit further though. Let's go ahead to the top of the 11th. 8-8 after a back and forth defensive battle. Fullerton breaks through with a base hit over to the right field and a runner's able to come through and get the score. For, so the Titans now have the lead and in the bottom of the 11th, Still 11-8, the Sun Devils unable to mount that comeback. Isaiah Jackson flies out with a can of corn to the center fielder. 11-8, the final score. Sun Devils drop one at home. Let's talk to uh, Willie Bloomquist after the game. We had every opportunity to win that game, and we just um, we couldn't put it away. Um, every time we scored, we, we gave up a, at least one run the, the next inning defensively. Um, we couldn't put up a zero after a score. I think that happened one, two, three, four, four straight times we scored. And they, they go back out and we can't put up a zero. Let's take a quick look at the upcoming schedule here for the Sun Devils. Number 23, Oregon on the road up in Eugene. And then they'll head back to Phoenix Muni to take on the second place team right behind the Sun Devils in the Pac-12 baseball standings. That's Stanford. And then they'll finish off the regular season on the road at USC and back home against the 23-13-1 UCLA Bruins. All right, so that's who's left for the Sun Devils as they look to stay on top of the Pac-12 and make a run in the postseason. A whole lot can change depending on how those series go down. So to help lay it all out, here's Aiden Blank. For the rest of the season for Arizona State relies heavily on the consistency of Sun Devil pitching. There was a lot of learning after year one of the Bloomquist era, and he's had to tinker around in year two. In the best case scenario, Christian Curtis is now capable of earning a win every weekend. With a high leverage fastball and a deceiving curveball, Curtis stands to be a true star in this rotation. With Ross Dunn in a more comfortable role and Timmy Manning rounding out the weekend following a dominant midweek performance, along with a bullpen backed up by Stevenson, Teeting, Lebemoff, and Pivaroff, this team has enough to keep them in any series. With a lineup that's averaging just under eight runs per game in their last 10 and adding the Pac-12's average leader in Ryan Campos, this team can bash their way through any rotation. By tournament time, the Sun Devils could win three of four series and squeak into the 16th and final spot as a regional host, bringing a regional to Muni for the first time in its history. 
Although assaulting their way through games has brought the Sun Devils some late success, there's only so long that can last. Worst case scenario, ASU is mowed down by some of the best arms in the country. In their last four series, the Devils lineup faces four of the best five rotations in the conference, including a Stanford squad that's got three starters, allowing a combined 200 batting average. If the bats go even slightly cold, which in college baseball is bound to happen, a Sun Devil pitching staff simply doesn't have the depth to last a weekend set. With only one pitcher with an ERA below four in 20 or more innings pitched, there's only so far this staff can go. A cold offense and a thin pitching staff is a perfect recipe for a downward spiral. This dreadful concoction would lead the Devils to series losses in all four series to end the season, including a Cardinals sweep at home. With a 7-18 and final record against Quad 1 teams, the Devils would have to make the Pac-12 championship to comfortably advance into the field of 64. We talk dream and nightmare scenarios, but when all is said and done, most likely the big two question marks would be the pitching depth and consistency at the plate. Lately, bats have been the centerpiece for Arizona State, and the addition of Ryan Campos will make it hard to pitch run any part of the lineup. If the pitching staff can keep the team in games, the safest bet for the final month gives ASU an even conference record of 6-6, six and six, with series losses to Oregon and Stanford, and series wins against UCLA and USC. A healthy performance in the Pac-12 tournament could lead Arizona State to a two seed, making the tournament for the first time in the Willie Bloomquist era. For Cronkite Sports, I'm Aiden Blank. Thank you, Aiden. We're just a few weeks out now from knowing what the answer will be. And now brackets, they can get pretty confusing. So to break down the current status of ASU baseball and where they stand, here's Jaden Taylor for some bracketology. Thanks, Sammy. Currently projected as a two seed in the Gainesville Regional by D1 Baseball, the course for the rest of the season is going to be driven by one term, quad one wins. The Sun Devils are currently 32 in the RPI, and the biggest blemish on the resume is a 4-9 and nine record up against such teams. However, their four remaining series are up against RPI number 18, Stanford, number 20, Oregon, number 31, UCLA, and number 58, USC. If the Sun Devils win all four of these series, this can shoot themselves up to a top 16 team. If they lose all for, they could be on the wrong side of the final 64 teams. A lot to look forward to in this final month, but getting these quad one wins to add to their resume will be a key to getting a high tournament seed. Thanks, Jaden. As I said earlier, a lot of games left that will affect where the team ends up. To give us a better idea of what the Sun Devils will be facing up in Eugene over the weekend, we bring in our own Sean Brennan. Sean, thanks so much for coming on the show, and let's go ahead and jump right into this thing. So clearly, as we reach the end of the season, the level of competition continues to increase for the Sun Devils. Is this the toughest matchup they've faced yet? Well, Ethan, you can honestly say that every weekend going forward is going to be their toughest matchup of the season. Oregon's number three in the Pac-12 right now, and they slotted it in at number two. 23 in all the land in D1 Baseball's latest poll, and that's for good reason. They've won seven of their last 10, and they picked up a series victory over Stanford during that stretch. Not an easy thing to do. Now, starting offensively, Oregon has had a top five offense in the conference since league play began, and their staff isn't as strong, but they're still more than capable of throwing strikes and limiting hits and getting through innings. What are the biggest keys for Arizona State here as they head up to Eugene? Well, for me, it comes down to one, and that's how you start games. In three contests last week against Oregon State, ASU was outscored 26 to 15 in the first five innings. They were also victim to eight errors during that series, and Willie Bloomquist just came out and said that we got to do a better job at setting the tone. Like you said, Oregon State has an explosive offense. They're going to have to do that. Now, to be fair, ASU has shown that they're never out of game and they can always claw back, but the catch-up game might not be a winning one against an Oregon team that's 22-2 and two this season when leading after five. All right, yeah, we'll have to see if they can get off to a better start. Thank you so much, Sean, for coming in. Well, with the Sun Devils on the road this weekend and not at Phoenix Muni, we thought it'd be a good idea to highlight the crew that keeps the field in prime condition. Here's Blake Neiman with the feature. The smooth dirt. The finely cut grass. The freshly painted bases. All these things and more make Phoenix Municipal Stadium one of the many beautiful ballparks around the valley. Yet the field doesn't just look perfect on its own. There's a crew of people behind the scenes who work tirelessly from early in the morning until the late hours of the night to keep the field in tip-top shape. The Arizona State Baseball grounds crew led by John Larson makes the magic happen. Well, we get here early in the, you know, earlier in the morning, about four hours, five hours before game time. Actually, we're earlier than that. Um, 
But yeah, so we come in, make sure there isn't any irrigation leaks or anything like that, start mowing and whatever pattern we're mowing for this series. And, and that's where we start off at. Larson and his staff don't just treat Phoenix Muni like any old baseball field. There is an art form behind every field work session. By creating unique mowing patterns and paint designs, the crew tries to make the most enjoyable baseball setting possible. It, it's fun for the players, you know, they like all the, you know, like like the star with the, the Arizona State flag. They love that uh, pattern and um, that's something new that we did this year, but it's more just something that something that's different, something that's unique. It's not the same thing over and over again and it, it, it's, it's more for everybody. The Browns crew carries quite the equipment load to keep the Sun Devils backyard in shape, including a broom, shovel, and many other larger items such as the grass mower and sand pro. Yet none of those tasks amount to the difficulty of maintaining the water that gives the field its luscious green color. A lot, a lot of people look at the grass and they're like, oh yeah, the grass looks great, it looks beautiful, but we probably spend more time on our dirt than we do with the grass. Um, it's probably like a 60-40 percent of our time. So, you know, getting the right moisture content in the dirt and, and in the mounds and home plates and stuff like that because we're dealing with a lot of different materials. Water becomes even more important in the off season when temperatures reach over 100 degrees. This makes the role of the groundskeeper not just seasonal work, but a full-time job. In the summertime, we still do a lot of work around here. It's um, same things with aerating. We do a lot of top dressing with sand and stuff like that um, and fertilizing and and uh, this ra this ryegrass will go away and it'll become Bermuda grass and you know so working on that transition um, pretty much all summer and then you know that's whenever we start getting into fall ball and you know preparing for that. So next time you go to an ASU baseball game make sure to take some time to appreciate the little things that go a long way to make Phoenix Muni what it is today. For Cronkite Sports I am Blake Neiman. All right, thank you so much, Blake. It really is incredible what John Larson and company can do to make Phoenix Muni such a special place. Absolutely, Sammy. Now let's bring on someone who we know appreciates the ground coup at ASU just as much as we do. That's the head coach of Arizona State Football, Kenny Dillingham. Coach, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Of course, thank you all for having me. All right, so the spring game is now a couple weeks behind us. When the media heard from you last, you were overcoming a cold, you know, potentially a bit of a lack of sleep. So now that we're almost to May, What's your day, to bit, day been like uh, in comparison to early April? Yeah, uh, just different, you know. That's the fun part about college athletics is you have a different job every few months, you know. You're a football coach, right, and then you're a recruiter, and then you're a scheduler and a planner and a businessman, uh, and then you're a fundraiser. So right now is a lot of, a lot of recruiting, a lot of evaling. Uh, especially with the new portal, you know, you're evaluating kids that go on the portal constantly. Uh, and then you're building relationships with guys quickly that enter the portal at this day, day and age. And then on weekends, you have official visits. So uh, it's just kind of uh, everything but really coaching is kind of the role right now because most of our players are gone and they're uh, headed back home for two to three weeks. And coach, you've been leading Sun Devil football now for five months. Maybe it feels like an eternity. Maybe it feels like five seconds. But what have been some major lessons that you've learned as you lead a Division One program for the very first time? Yeah, I would say just listen to people. You know, you're not the only person, uh, you know, that has all the right answers. So continuing to listen to people and take ideas from people. Uh, and then just stay true to who you are. I would say those are two lessons that, that I've learned is don't try to be somebody you're not and combine that with just continuing to listen and and uh, bring ideas from everybody uh, into your program constantly so, so it's not stale. Coach, so while class for people like us here at the desk may be dismissed in the summer, plenty of work still to be done when it comes to Arizona State football in the offseason. So as you head into this period of time, what do you know about your football team as it stands today? I know they believe in, uh, in what we're trying to get accomplished. Uh, I know they, they have a, a passion and a chip on their shoulder, uh, either the chip on their shoulder from the guys that were here last year or the chip on their shoulder from the guys that transferred here uh, and it didn't go great in whatever way, shape or form uh, their circumstance dictated last year. So we have a lot of guys with a chip on their shoulder and they're growing together and we're becoming a team. So that's what I've learned is these guys want to win. They're passionate, they have a chip on their shoulder, and uh, they're coming together. And then more importantly, I mean, we have, a, we have good kids. Like we have good human beings on our team. 
And coach, there's no doubt that this program has changed dramatically since you've taken over. You've done so much to grow the culture and show your passion for the Valley. What excites you the most as you get ready to take on your first season at the helm? I mean, I just, the highs and the lows. I know nobody says the lows excite you, but I'm excited to see our team respond to the good and the bad, right? That's really what this is about. You know, it's about teaching guys that when great things happen, there's still something that happens after it. How do you respond to that? And when bad things happen, there's still something that happens after it. How do you respond to it? So what am I excited for? I'm excited to be able to coach and teach and get into those moments where there's extreme panic, right? There's extreme chaos, right? And be able to coach and teach and grow these guys to have them understand that this is life. There's ups and downs. It's all about your response. Well, it's been exciting for us as media to see basketball hoops getting wheeled out at practice and at the spring game as well. So coach, we're curious here in the studio, if you could pick one assistant coach to team up with for a little team-wide 2v2 basketball tournament, who are you picking and why? Well, there's, ah, oh man, that's <laughs> tough. Uh, it would either be Coach Samp or Coach Baldwin. So Coach Samp was probably the guy, uh, probably has got the most juice, but Coach Baldwin, when he gets his hat on backwards and he turns into a competitor, I, I kind of want him in my corner, so I'd have to be one of those two. Well, Coach, thank you again for taking the time to come on Cronkite Sports Live today. It means a lot to us, and you'll always be welcome to come on. We'll catch up with you in the fall, and good luck this summer. Sounds good. Thank you all for having me. Go Devils. All righty, moving on to Arizona State softball. The Sun Devils are hosting number nine Stanford in just a couple hours at Farrington Stadium. The Cardinal are known for having an elite pitching core and to help preview that unit, here's Lauren Nunez. For the Sun Devils final home series at Farrington, they will face one of the most dangerous pitching staffs in the country, the Stanford Cardinal. A team ERA of 153 and two top of the line starters are going to be a challenging series ahead for Arizona State. Let's start it off with freshman phenom Nigel Kennedy. At Pac-12 leading 0-29 ERA, Kennedy goes straight at hitters. The 123 strikeouts this season have come heavily reliant on a fastball and a rise ball. Targeting the top half of the zone, the righty gets a lot of swing and misses. As mentioned, Kennedy isn't afraid to test hitters, which can sometimes come back to bite her. With a fastball north of 65 miles an hour, a ball left over the heart of the plate can mean damage. If the Sun Devils can catch up to the flame-throwing righty, a bite-sized ballpark in Farrington can become a hefty advantage. Now to veteran Elena Vodder. The senior Vodder offsets the fastball Dominic Kennedy with a changeup and a screwball dotted at the knees. Vodder likes to attack the corner, staying much to her arm side and getting hitters on top of pitches. Even with 113 strikeouts on the year, Vodder pitches heavily to contact. With a top of the line defense behind her, the two-time Pac-12 teamer has the confidence to continue to pound the zone. If the Sun Devils have any hope of scoring runs off her, they're going to have to find a way to hit into the gaps and avoid easy ground outs. The Cardinals this weekend will look to build off a weekend series win against rival Cal, and their dominant starters will be a big factor in keeping their momentum going. It's a tough task for the Sun Devils to step up even at home, but after losing eight straight games, this team desperately needs a spark. For Cronkite Sports, I'm Lauren Nunez. All right, thank you, Lauren. Let's check in live now at Club Farrington, where our Max Zapata is getting ready for tonight's game. Max, what more can you tell us about this matchup with Stanford? Thanks so much, Sammy. I'm coming back outside live from, from Club Farrington, and let's just talk about this matchup because the truth is, is that softball is so much more than pitching because even though it is going to be 96 degrees here at Club Farrington once first pitch happens, that means there's a chance that balls could be flying out of here, and that could possibly be an advantage offensively when it comes to these Sun Devils. I mean, even when it comes to facing a difficult pitching staff like Stanford, this offense has been actually putting up some numbers as of late. And specifically when it comes to the home run ball, they're third in the conference in home runs with 55, nearly four times as many as Stanford, who only have 16. However, Stanford has been hitting a lot of doubles and triples as they are in the top three in the conference and both of those categories, including in the conference and triples. So if there's a chance that ASU could possibly hit some balls out of the yard, plus have a good pitching performance or two, this could possibly be a chance for ASU to possibly steal a game or two another top 10 team this season and once again possibly shock the softball world even on their senior weekend here at Farrington Stadium. Back to you guys at the desk. Well thank you so much Max. I really appreciate it and it's hot out there like you said so make sure you put on that sunscreen and stay cool out there. One unique thing happening out at Farrington are the handshakes that happen pregame. 
The softball team is notorious for having some of the longest and most creative handshake lines at ASU. For a quick look into the tradition, here's Grace Johnson. Hey guys, I'm Grace Johnson. I'm here with Gianna Bocagno and Alexa Milius, and we're here to talk about the ASU softball handshake line. So how long has this handshake line been going on? That's a good question. Um, we're both new here, but I know I played against ASU a few years ago. They were doing the handshakes. I think it's been a tradition for a while now. Um, it's just something that gets you kind of like focused in and it's something fun to do, something fun for other teams to see that chemistry and stuff as well. You guys do it before every game, so how does it affect the team's energy like before the start of the game? I definitely think that we kind of look forward to doing those handshakes because like Lex said, it's something that unique that you have with each individual on the team. Um, it's kind of like, hey, like I got you, like we're going into this game together kind of thing. Um, I don't know, I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, I think it like loosens us up a bit. And, like some people are so funny, so it just gets people laughing and it gets everyone to know like we're ready to go. All right, now that we talked a little about handshakes, I'm gonna see if I can live up to the ASU softball expectations and learn a few handshakes. You guys ready? Yeah, Absolutely. let's do it. <laughs> Slay. That's it for us here at Club Farrington's Cronkite Sports. I'm Grace Johnson. Grace, you were killing it out there. I think you fit right in with them. All right, let's talk some Sun Devil tennis. The women's team was upset by USC yesterday in the corner finals of the Pac-12 championships, but are still expected to make an appearance in the NCAA regionals. Jonah Krell is at the green screen to fill you in on the Sun Devils. The Arizona State women's tennis team has been dominant all year, finishing the regular season at 17-5 and 7-3 in Pac-12 play, its best league finish since 2018. And through it all, the Sun Devils' depth has shined, with each player practically having their own superpower. Let's start at the number one single spot with Julia Morlay. Associate head coach Matt Langley's one word to describe Morlay was intensity. The French junior was out for over a month earlier in the year, but has since found her footing with two singles wins to end the regular season. The consistent face on court two has been senior Dominika Turkovic, who Langley calls a worker. Now in her third year with ASU, that work ethic has paid off as she has had her best statistical season as a Sun Devil with a 12 and five singles mark. Next is the freshman phenom Chelsea Fontenelle, who started her season 11 and 0. She's an aggressive player, hitting baseliners and big serves, and she's also pursuing a career as a singer simultaneously, so it makes sense that her word is simply talented. On court four is junior Mariana Argyro Castridi, and when she plays, you can hear her all the way from downtown Phoenix. That's how passionate she plays tennis. The crafty Argyro Castridi, or Argy as they call her, is having a career year with a 17 and two record. The number five singles player, Sedona Gallagher, has been consistent all season long with an 11 and three record. Langley rotated around the word competitor and gamer for the Washington transfer, but you get the idea. She gets up for match days and performs. Last but not least is Rachel Hanford, a junior transfer from Minnesota. Langley said she's bought into her role with her discipline and her great physical shape, and it's led to an eight and one record with an increased role down the stretch of the season. And we didn't even mention sophomore Patricia Spaka, who pairs with Turkovic as the ITA's number 24 ranked doubles pairing in the country. Overall, this lineup can beat you all over the place, making them a dangerous out when the NCAA championships get going in May. Guys, back to you. ASU Wrestling is a perennial contender for NCAA titles, both on the team side as well as the individual side. Part of that is thanks to the facilities they have access to. But one wrestler in particular has one in his own backyard. Kellen Croxton got the in-depth tour with Diego Chavez. We actually got this one donated to us by one of my dad's friends, and it's like 100, 120 pounds maybe. These right here, these out frames is where our wall mats are going to be. We're going to be able to have this all covered. Got our nice soft mats, actually. I'm really picky about my mats. I don't really like the jujitsu mats or whatever. They have like a scrape up your knees and stuff. 
These are soft, comfortable, perfect. So we got the rope in about 30 to 45 seconds. Switch them. Just shoulder, forearm workout, really important in wrestling. Uh, we got the ropes, I could demonstrate. My dad's really big about touching that. And then when you come down, he wants us to like keep our uh, elbows like at a 90, go down slow so you don't hurt your hands and also not cheat yourself or anything. This one was donated to us and a little bit bigger, able to do film and stuff like that. Um, right here we have our, what is this called, Zave? I don't even know what it's called, but it shoots out flames and it makes this room hot. That's all I know. And you give that like 10, 15 minutes, this room would be like 95 degrees. Um, how I know that, we got a thermostat over here. Resting room, resting family. You gotta know how hot it is in here, right? How it's about 90, so it's not too bad. But you got the heater in here too, it's like extra. You can check out the rest of that feature on our YouTube. Sammy, I know another guy who has no problem getting down and dirty. It's Big Diesel. Yeah, Ethan, that Minnesota kid is really needing a tan. And luckily, the B team has already gone on vacation. So Riley Swenson made his way to the beach for a Sun Devil year in review. Didn't see you there. Welcome to the beach. What am I reading, you ask? Uh, this is just a Sun Devil Athletics year in review about all the things they accomplished. Why don't I tell you the story? The story begins in August with Herm Edwards leading the charge of ASU football. It's week three and Eastern Michigan is in town. Well, wait a minute. I thought the bad parts were cut out. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, hopefully the kids weren't watching because that story could give them nightmares. Anyway, uh, wh where were we? So Edwards was fired. It was a whole deal, but no need to get into it. Next in line was Sean Aguano. In just his third game as head coach, he burst onto the scene, slaying the dragon of 21st-ranked Washington. The football team finished the year 3-9, and nine, but stay tuned because there's more on them later, and it's kind of important. The story continues with the hockey team opening up a new chapter in their program. Mullet Arena was unveiled to the public in October, and let me tell you, it's pretty cool. What was even cooler was the Sun Devils' play on the ice. They got arguably the biggest win in program history on Halloween weekend, taking down college hockey powerhouse North Dakota in Las Vegas. But that win was quickly outdone on another holiday, with the Devils beating then number two ranked Minnesota in the new arena on Thanksgiving weekend. Unfortunately for them, the season went downhill after that, but you can expect the sequel at Mullet later this season to be pretty special. This is just, yeah, oh, this is just some refreshing water from the lake over here that no one seems to be taking advantage of. Not to be taken out of the spotlight of our story, the football team made a splash in late November with the signing of Kenny Dillingham. The new main character is the youngest Power 5 head coach in football, and his signature catchphrase of Activate the Valley is being spread quickly. Moving on to 2023, a lot of names to keep track of, but let me introduce you to the biggest one of all. Desmond Cambridge completely changed the course of this story with a half-court heave to lift ASU over that team down south. He'll probably never have to pay for a uh, soda in Tempe again. Children's book, remember, people. The team went on to make the NCAA tournament, and after trouncing Nevada in the first four, their season ended on, you guessed it, a buzzer beater. The irony from these script writers is just fantastic, isn't it? Leon Marchand and the men's swim team were a major bright spot in this whole thing, with Marchand dominating the entire year. Like, seriously, do a Google search, it's crazy. The team plays second in the country, which is their best finish ever. Now that it's spring, baseball and softball are in action. The softball squad is led by first-year head coach Megan Bartlett and are trying to fight their way into the tournament, while Willie Bloomquist and company are walking people off left and right and might even host a regional. Woo. That was a lot, wasn't it? And we didn't even get to some of the key parts. Don't worry, though. I'll be back in the fall, and we will continue this story then. Well, if excuse me, I'm going to take a dip in the lake. Riley, that looks like a pretty tight white shirt. I hope you aren't, you know, feeling too nasty after that sip out of Tempe Town Lake. Just disgusting, man. It really was, and I hope you'll actually make it to the fall after that one. Whew. And now it's time for some top plays. At number three, we're heading over to Phoenix Muni. And look at this, Isaiah Jackson 
gets it. He's just doing what he does best at this point. What an absolute sudden, only a freshman, guys. Unbelievable. Yeah, not the only play we're going to see from him, Sammy, but let's go ahead and check out number two. McGee in the circle for the Sun Devils. The catcher throws it over to second base trying to pick off that runner. Pickle, we got a runner in between the infielders, and they're able to tag out another runner in between first and second. A great play against a highly touted UCLA program. And for number one, we're going back to the diamond. None other than Isaiah Jackson with the walk off homer. Look at him go. He says, let's go. Looking at the dugout, ASC would end up beating Oregon State. Absolutely phenomenal effort by the Sun Devils against the Beavers. And well, that'll do it for this season of Cronkite Sports Live. I can't even begin to put into words how much this show means to me. This studio is filled with some of the best memories of my entire life. And I want to give a special thank you to the incredible executive producers that have helped me along the way. Mike McQuaid and Nick Borgia and Ethan. I can't imagine going on this crazy journey um, with anybody else. Thank you for always being here to make me laugh right before we go live. And I will never forget our very first show where I was quite literally shaking when that red light turned on. But you looked at me and you said, hey, we've got this and yep. we've had this ever since. I'm gonna miss sitting here at this desk so much, but I'm so blessed with the time I've had and I can't wait for the future it has in store for us. Yeah, I'll second that. Being an anchor on this show has been an unforgettable experience. I'll never forget sitting down on this desk for the first time, Sammy. I'll miss laughing with everybody here in the studio and with you on the desk, but I can't wait to continue producing great content with the rest of the club. And we'd love to take a moment here to thanks to everyone who tunes in, everyone who supports us, and everyone behind the scenes who make this show possible. Two of those people are graduating college this semester, Peyton Gallagher and Trey Jordan. There they are in the control room trying to hold it together for their last show. I mean, Peyton literally reimagined the look of this entire CSL that we've created. And Trey Jordan makes the magic happen on the switcher as well as in the edit bays. He puts in tons of hours just like everybody else in this production. And we wouldn't be capable of doing all of this without everyone involved. And we wish them the best of luck in what's next for them. And for now, one final sign off as anchors. This has been Sammy Miller for Ethan Tuttle and the rest of our incredible club. We appreciate you tuning in. You really thought I was going to jump in there? <laughs> no way. You're crazy. But what are you still doing here? Show's over, people. Go home. We'll see you in the fall.